Hello, knowledge seekers. In this episode of 20 Minute Books, we're sinking our teeth into Rachel Hofstetter's Cooking Up a Business. Published in 2013, this book serves as a motivational guide for the foodie with entrepreneurial aspirations. If you're dabbling in a new product idea or searching for ways to re-energize your existing business strategy, Hofstetter provides valuable advice peppered with authentic, inspiring stories from successful entrepreneurs in the food industry. Rachel Hofstetter is a passionate food writer whose work has graced the pages of respected magazines like O, The Oprah Magazine, and Reader's Digest. Aside from her writing endeavors, she's the founder of Guesterly, a unique service that crafts who's who guides for personal and corporate events. Cooking Up a Business is the perfect recipe book for aspiring food entrepreneurs. It's also a must-read for creative individuals seeking insider tips on scaling and marketing their fresh product ideas. Plus, anyone with a curiosity about the -the behind-the-scenes happenings of food startups will find this book quite the appetizing read. So, gear up for a delicious journey into the world of food entrepreneurship. Cooking up a business, lessons from food lovers who turned their passion into a career and how you can too. Introduction, unlock your culinary ambition. Venture into the realm of food entrepreneurship. Are you a self-proclaimed food critic, mesmerized by the brilliance of MasterChef? Do you savor every morsel you taste, relishing each unique blend of flavors? Have you ever sampled something and instantly thought, I could definitely outdo this? If the prospect of becoming a food entrepreneur tantalizes your taste buds, you're at the right place. What we're about to discuss is derived from the tales of culinary connoisseurs who followed their gastronomic passion to establish prosperous businesses. It's time to move beyond your kitchen confines and carve your niche in the sprawling food market. It's a universal truth. Everyone needs to eat. Embarking on a culinary enterprise holds the potential to fill your coffers, provided you navigate the numerous hurdles that come your way successfully. So grab that saute pan, sharpen your chef's knife, and let the wisdom of veteran professionals guide you on this exciting journey. In this narrative, we will uncover why fresh food products have to dance to the tune of countless official regulations, how a few simple giveaways could catapult you to immediate success, and why when it comes to food products, necessity is truly the mother of invention. Part 1. Embrace the challenge. Limited finances can spur creativity and resilience. You often hear the rallying cry to pursue your dreams from self-help books and your inner circle. But what if those dreams involve diving into the food business and there's a noticeable dent in your finances? Don't view lack of funds as a full stop. It's actually an invitation to let your creativity and resourcefulness shine Consider the story of Maddy D'Amato and Alex Hasulak, the brains behind Love Grown Foods. As college students, they were captivated by the idea of turning Maddy's family's tasty granola recipes into a viable business. But as most students do, they faced financial constraints. To tackle this, the pair split their time between their day jobs, their parents' homes, and a catering kitchen. Night after night, They industriously prepared and packed granola by hand, all the while entertaining themselves with movies to keep the energy high. These early days were challenging, yet joyful. D'Amato and Hasulak demonstrated that hard work could kickstart a business, even with minimal startup capital. Another crucial lesson from their journey is the importance of being comfortable selling your product before it's even produced. It may sound risky, but it can save you from unnecessary expenditures. Love Grown Foods' initial clients were a pair of local coffee shops, a modest but promising start. However, D'Amato and Hasulak dreamed bigger. Soon enough, they secured a significant deal with the Aspen City market. Despite their initial worry over meeting the large order, they rolled up their sleeves, clocked in long hours, and hit their deadline. Their hard work paid off when they bagged a deal with King Supers, a Denver supermarket chain 
that would take their product to 40 stores, and then to 80. That success allowed D'Amato and Hasulak to devote all their time to love-grown foods. In an awe-inspiring example of scaling, their product graced the shelves of 1,300 stores just a year and a half after their first supermarket deal. Quite a leap from their humble beginnings. Part 2. Stay true to your brand story, even as your product evolves. Is it a given that to launch a food business, you must first identify your product? Surely it's a must, isn't it? Well, not exactly. Some of the finest ideas spring from a cycle of trial and error, particularly in the gastronomic world. Take Zach Zeidman, for instance. He was certain that he wanted to aid organic farmers in Costa Rica, but finding the right product to market successfully took him a bit of time. Zaidman was enchanted by the Costa Rican landscape. However, he saw that pesticide use in banana farming was causing considerable damage to this beautiful region. Furthermore, the working conditions on the banana farms were subpar, and this motivated him to do something to ameliorate the workers' plight. Merely importing bananas didn't offer enough support to the farms to gain a competitive edge in the broader market. Hence, Zaidman explored the idea of selling banana vinegar, a local product. He also imported chocolate and dried fruits. To his astonishment, the vinegar didn't take off, but the chocolate became a crowd pleaser. Today, his company, Kopali Organics, has its products on the shelves of all Whole Foods markets across the United States. Even though Zeidman's initial product didn't hit the mark, his fallback idea and the compelling brand story, focusing on organic, fair trade products, struck a chord with consumers. Parallelly, entrepreneurs Shannon Swanson and Leanne Weintraub embarked on their food business journey without a definitive product in mind. As young mothers, they aspired to supply children with organic baby food. They envisioned their company at the forefront of the market, but the how part was still a mystery. After a session with brand strategist Susan White, Swanson and Weintraub concluded that their company would revolve around three primary attributes authenticity, complete organic composition, and, crucially, a fun element. Though they ultimately swapped their product line from baby food to children's fruit snacks, they steadfastly adhered to their original brand values. Part 3. The Delicate Dance of Scaling. Maintain control and pivot when necessary. A good number of triumphant food entrepreneurs kickstart their journey from their home kitchen turning a cherished recipe into a business venture. However, scaling that modest kitchen recipe to a business operating across multiple states isn't a piece of cake. Mary Waldner's experience emphasizes the importance of retaining personal involvement in production during scaling. She was motivated to start a gluten-free product business, having been diagnosed with a gluten allergy herself, a condition relatively unknown in the 1990s. Waldner created gluten-free crackers, which quickly became a hit among her friends, encouraging her to develop the product commercially. And that's how Mary Gone Crackers came to be. As the demand for Waldner's crackers soared, her team initiated a co-packing operation. Even though this represented a significant leap forward, it introduced a new set of challenges. Waldner found herself with less control over her product, and the crackers weren't being made to her exacting standards. This predicament prompted a change in direction. Securing venture capital, Waldner set up her own factory. Despite producing less volume, she regained control over the production process. This move improved her product quality, and Waldner chose to let her brand and company evolve at a slower but more sustainable pace. While some businesses risk scaling too swiftly, Others find scaling a tough mountain to climb. Phil Anson aimed to wholesale fresh burritos, but grappled with stringent food regulations. As production shifted from his Colorado cabin to a commercial kitchen, Anson discovered that fresh wholesale products containing meat were legally required to be prepared in a USDA-approved facility. After five years wrestling with cost, distribution nightmares, and issues with shelf life, 
it became glaringly evident that his fresh food product was simply too challenging to scale for the wholesale market. So Anson did some research and decided to pivot to frozen food, as these products are much more scalable compared to fresh items. Today, Anson's Evol brand of frozen burritos can be found in 7,000 stores, a staggering increase from the 400 that stocked his fresh product. Part 4. Leveraging short-term credit and equity partnerships for a cash-strapped start. Securing sufficient funding is a common hurdle for startups, and it's particularly intimidating for food-based businesses. With expensive manufacturing requirements, potential shelf life issues, the ongoing quest for suppliers and transportation, it may take some time for a food business to become profitable. So how can you navigate these treacherous waters and ensure your food business survives this challenging initial phase? An innovative strategy involves selling your product to retailers before you even buy the necessary supplies. Take Cameron Hughes Wine as an example. They acquire surplus wine in large quantities from producers unwilling or unable to bottle and sell it themselves. The wine is then marketed under the Cameron Hughes wine label. This approach, known as the negotiant business model in the wine industry, has roots stretching back to antiquity. But how could Cameron Hughes wine afford such substantial stock up front? The answer lies in a second strategy. Cameron Hughes sells its wines to bulk retailers, and these retailers offer a short-term line of credit that Cameron Hughes uses to procure the bulk wine. Once Cameron Hughes Wine delivers the stock, the credit is repaid in full. This strategy provides an effective means to scale up a business without significant initial capital. Equity or offering company shares is another avenue to explore when capital is scarce. When entrepreneur Justin Gold of Justin's Nut Butters wanted to scale up his business, he knew he needed the wisdom of an experienced businessman. Lance Gentry was the man for the job, chosen by Gold due to his impressive track record of transforming a small-scale company into a $25 million enterprise. While Gentry's skills were unquestionable, Gold couldn't afford to pay him the high salary he was accustomed to. So, Gold opted to compensate Gentry with shares in his company. Gold and Gentry then joined forces to attract more investors, dividing the shares equitably among them, so that Gold maintained ultimate decision-making authority in the business. This network provided the much-needed impetus for Gold's business to soar. Part 5. Mastering the Art of Product Creation Identifying Needs and Designing for Simplicity or Luxury in the realm of food entrepreneurship, almost any food can be transformed into a marketable product. But is there a recipe for determining which food items are ideal for commercial ventures? Honestly, there's no magic formula, but what's most critical is identifying a unique need that your product can fulfill. Whether simple or luxurious, products that serve a vital need have a higher chance of success. Take, for instance, the journey of food entrepreneur Cara Golden. Keen on reducing sugar intake for her family, Golden faced a challenge. Most commercially available flavored drinks were loaded with artificial sugars, but water, while healthier, was too mundane, especially for her children. Within this challenge, Golden found an opportunity, a void in the market for a flavorful drink without sugar. Adding some fruit pieces to water, Golden concocted a subtly flavored drink she adored which later became the blueprint for her product, Hint. Golden's tale illustrates how even a straightforward need can birth a simple yet appealing product. Luxury products also can effectively satisfy particular customer needs. Consider the story of Katrina Markov. Having worked in numerous elite restaurants, Markov had developed a fascination for unique flavor combinations leading her to globetrot in pursuit of diverse tastes. Upon returning home, she found that her once-favored American-made chocolate tasted overly sweet and artificial. This observation sparked a realization. There was a market for chocolate that catered to more refined tastes. Inspired by the flavors she encountered in India, Markov experimented with her own recipes. With a collection of successful recipes, she concluded that her brand, Vosges Haute Chocolat, should exude luxury, matching the exquisite taste of her product. The packaging, marketing, and the ambience of her retail outlets 
all mirrored the rich, lavish experience her chocolates offered. Part 6. Cultivating Customer Curiosity with Strategic Free Samples and Personalized Promotions Is it even possible to resist free samples at a store? It's a simple marketing trick that works like a charm. After all, experiencing a delectable new flavor is often all it takes to persuade a customer to make a purchase. So, why not encourage a potential customer to try before they buy? Offering samples is a compelling method to pique customer interest in your food product and the backstory that accompanies it. Take, for example, the team behind Love Grown Foods. Their initial promotional strategy involved crisscrossing Colorado, offering free granola samples in supermarkets. This humble approach got people buzzing about their product. However, such an exhaustive campaign might not be feasible for everyone. In such instances, you can opt for a targeted campaign, distributing samples at places frequented by your prospective customers. Keith Belling employed this strategy when he launched Pop Chips, his low-fat alternative to baked and fried chips. His promotional campaign started on the West Coast, aligning his health-centric snack with the wellness-oriented lifestyle prevalent in Los Angeles. Upon reaching New York, Belling understood the necessity of adapting his promotional tactics to this tougher market. Alongside offering samples at grocery stores, Belling also distributed them at high-profile events like Fashion Week. His chips gained popularity as he zeroed in on influential celebrities, sending them sample packages along with personalized handwritten notes. Within a year, Pop Chips was available in over 2,000 stores in Manhattan alone. Belling's story is a testament to the power of strategic promotional moves in generating buzz for your business. Final summary. Are you drawn towards the idea of transforming your fervor for locally sourced produce, wholesome eating, or fair trade practices into a thriving business venture? Then by all means, take the plunge. A food-based business does come with its fair share of challenges. From tackling the issue of funding to the task of scaling your operations. However, with a dash of resourcefulness, a sprinkle of creativity, and unwavering commitment to your brand's core values, you'll undoubtedly savor the sweet taste of triumph as the world relishes your innovative food product. Thank you for joining me today on this journey of learning and discovery as we explored the insights of another thought-provoking book in our growing library of knowledge. If you've enjoyed our time together, please take a moment to follow our podcast, give us a five-star rating, and share 20-minute books with other knowledge seekers. Your support truly means a lot. Don't forget to join me again in the next episode, where we will delve into another enriching book. Until then. Happy reading and happy listening.